Thank you for listening to Coffee with the Crossing. My name is Cody Most. I'm joined today with Eric Most, Barry Holbrook, and Jonathan Phillips. Today we're going to talk about leadership in the church. We also had a camera issue, so there's not a video, but we really, really hope that you guys tune in and listen to this episode because it's a good one. So let's jump on in. Welcome back to Coffee with the Crossing. In these next couple episodes, we're going to talk about some of the leadership phrases and practices we have here at the Crossing. Um, One of the phrases you've probably heard us say at some point in time or you have noticed is um, bringing clarity in the midst of uncertainty. Um, Any of you want to expand on that? Yeah. One? So, uh, I, I love this. In fact, this is in some of our training. Um, and if you haven't heard this and you're a small group leader or life group leader, um, this is, uh, this is a huge deal. Um, the leader will always, people will attach or assume that you, whoever brings the first one to bring clarity to uncertainty will always be perceived as the leader. So, um, and you can experiment with this. So if you're, you know, if, if you're a life group leader and, uh, your life group gets together and, uh, and, and you might just sit back and not, um, give any direction. Or if you're in a group that's like that, where, uh, no one actually brings any direction, it drives you crazy. Why is it driving you crazy? because no one's bringing clarity to the uncertainty. That's what's going on. And so whoever is like, Hey, should we, you know, pray before we eat? Should we pray before we do this? Um, Hey, should we get started with our, our questions? Well, they're the ones who are bringing clarity in the middle of that uncertainty and, uh, they'll always be perceived as the leader. So if you're the leader and you're not bringing clarity to the uncertainty, (laughs) you should probably be bringing clarity to the uncertainty. But we talk about this, um, in our staff, uh, a lot of, um, are we bringing clarity in the midst of, um, uncertainty? So what are some instances that you guys have, have seen this and how important is it? I don't have a specific instance in mind, but one of the things that we talk about at staff meeting isn't just bringing clarity to the uncertainty. It's sitting around saying, what are areas that there is uncertainty and how can we bring clarity to it? So sometimes it's it's more than just like sitting at a life group and nobody's starting the meeting. It's uh, true leadership is is evaluating what you're doing and saying, okay, so there's there's uncertainty here. How can I bring clarity to this? So like I said, I don't have a specific instance that I can think of, but have you guys ever been in a meeting? I I know I was a part of a, uh, a planning meeting for an, for an event. Um, so I wasn't the guy in charge. And so I, I, I go to the meeting and quickly found out Nobody was in charge. I hate that. No one drove the meeting. I hate that. Does that drive you absolutely Mm -hmm. berserk? Yeah, because my personality is if if somebody doesn't drive that meeting soon, then I'm going to. (laughs) And uh, Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily like – so those of you who are listening and part of the crossing – it doesn't have to be the lead guy all the time. Uh, our staff meetings are led by Barry because we I've asked Barry, hey, would you drive those meetings? Um, and he does. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the the uh, the lead guy, but uh, someone's got to drive. Um, otherwise, uh, the thing that drives you crazy in that meeting, it's uncertainty, and no one's bringing clarity to it. Um So this can extend actually uh, into um, your homes as well. So this would be an interesting question between your spouse. Who's the first one to bring clarity to the uncertainty in your family? Well, that's easy. (laughs) 
Tanya won't even get offended. <laughs> she would agree. You know, so. Because they will be perceived as the leader, yep. which is just an interesting uh, conversation. So right now, you know, obviously we are in very uncertain times. So how do you lead in uncertain times? Well, um, you can't bring clarity around something you don't have any clarity around. So one of the mistakes we can make as a leader is we can fake like we know what's what to do when we don't have any idea what to do. So if you don't have any idea what to do, it's okay to say, I don't know, but it's not okay to be unclear about things that you do know. Um, so, uh, an instance of this is in the old Testament is Joshua. When God told him, Hey, in three days, I want you to cross the Jordan river and I want you, know, you to go to the other side. You're going into the promised land. So that's all the information Joshua had. So, uh, you know, I can only imagine a million people, the questions, We've been wandering, we're experts in wandering the wilderness. We've been doing that for 40 years. We know how to do that. Um, so Joshua, <clears throat> um, what, how, how are we going to cross the Jordan? I don't know. But in three days, we're crossing the Jordan. Well, what are we going to do on the other side? I don't know. But in three days, we're going to cross. So th- it's a perfect instance of a lot of uncertainty Joshua was given clarity around one element and he was very clear about it. And then everything else, it's like, we will deal with that when we get to that point. But I'm not going to pretend like I know when I don't know, but I'm going to be clear about what I do. The next phrase we have down is doing ministry open-handed. And how do you stay up to speed with culture? With culture? Mm-hmm. This is the way we've always done it. So how do you do ministry open-handed, stay up to speed with culture? I know open-handed ministry, the... Uh, not well not even open handed ministry open handed leadership you have to uh you have to get to a point where you're okay with it not being done to your standards um and uh for some people that's really really hard i think for a lot of people that's really really hard uh but the more open handed you are in letting other people take over some leadership you might begin to realize that your way is not the best way. <laughs> that was one thing that I definitely had to learn um, with youth ministry. So three years ago, well, I was here. I've been here for like three and a half years. Um, so we did our junior high and high school ministry together, and we were having I don't know eight high schoolers a week, something like that. And we just got to a point where we're like, you know what, we got to do something different to reach the high schoolers, and so. Uh, we got together and just talked about different people we thought would be good at leading the small groups. And so now we have two different small groups for high schoolers. And now we went from eight high schoolers a week to between the two groups, probably about 40. And that, that took, uh, kind of a hard, you know, a hard look at myself saying like, okay, what I'm doing is not working. So let's make it better. And, um, yeah, so being open-handed with your ministry or open-handed with your leadership is um, realizing that you don't have all the answers and sometimes other people have a better approach uh, than you do. Yeah, I think open-handed, if you um, have the goal uh, in mind, it is it is definitely vision-oriented. What's, what is the best way? And um, and if you don't know what the vision is, then it's going to be, you know, can be very difficult. And sometimes the vision is, um, 
whatever whatever makes it so people like me better. <laughs> See, and in John's instance, it it could, and and we're all sinners, so we, it, it's easy for us to to become close hand is like, but I'm the youth pastor. So I'm the one who should do all of the teaching. I'm the one who should do. And, you know, in all of our areas, it would be easy for me to be easy for me to say, I'm the one who should preach 52 weeks, you know, out of the year because, you know, open handed is no, no, no. I, you know, whatever is the best way to achieve the vision. So there, there's got to be a place where we're trying to get people to go or, or to achieve. But then I want to develop people and realize it's not about me. Um, and I want to develop people around me um, as we are moving towards that vision. That's That's fantastic. But it takes... Uh, people with a depth of maturity um, that doesn't often isn't often the case and uh, and being able to because that maturity means I'm 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 going to release this (laughs) and uh, I may not be able to control everything um, exactly the way I want to control it and you know it's open handed. Another thing that John does is uh, allows you know high schoolers to teach. Well, um, is it uh, the most amazing talk on the planet? Probably not. Um, but I tell you what, because it's peer led, everyone listens to it, and that person is being developed, and it's an opportunity for John to be. To, to be able to speak into them of how they can improve. So that would never happen if you were not open handed in ministry. And it leads right into our next couple of phrases. One's collaboration and one's team leadership. So collaboration, um, kind of goes along with uh, being open-handed in in something that we value. If you're not collaborating, if you're not open-handed, you are not going to be willing to collaborate. And when we when I say collaboration, I'm talking so we have children's ministry, we have student ministry, we have adult ministry, we have life group ministry, we have Sunday morning. Um and it would be easy for you know like like John and uh and Carissa to just say well I I do children's ministry well I do student ministry I'm not going to help you and I don't want you to help me I'm just going to do my own thing rather than realizing we are all working together um for the common for the common good and the common goal and uh being willing to to help in a different area, if I can help, collaboration, that's what collaboration is. And sometimes we have shared spaces. If we don't collaborate, there can be a civil war within within the walls of the building. Uh, I know John and Carissa, the kid kids' ministry and the youth ministry share, uh, share areas, and John has to make some concessions, and Carissa has to make concessions. And, and if they weren't collaborating, if they weren't part of a team— then that would cause problems. So knowing that we're all in it for one, for one purpose that we all have the same vision really helps. Yeah. I mean, I think about when we shut down because of COVID um, and all of us, you know, John it was hired as the youth pastor, um, worship pastor. And all of a sudden he's over there, you know, editing videos. Well, that's not what I was hired to do. And, and he could have just said, you know, forget it. I'm, I'm not. But that attitude of, you know what, whatever it takes and, ha- and, and whatever I need to do to make the vision happen, I'm willing to do that. It, um, it was a tremendous, and it was a huge load on him, but it was a tremendous benefit um, 
to this, the ongoing, to our ministry. And it was purely because he was willing to be open handed and collaborate outside of the area that uh, we kind of hired him to do. So, collaboration's a big, big deal. It's easy to have, have silos. And don't touch my mic stands. Don't touch my stuff. That's my stuff. It's not your stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, this is my space, not your space. Uh, it's easy to have that, but great leadership um, involves collaboration. Yeah, one of the things you always say is keep the main thing the main thing. And that's like what Barry was talking about with knowing that we're all on the same mission. We all have the same end goal and that's, what's key for it. Well, it's like, um, I'm one of the teenage small group leaders. Uh, and I, and I've been in youth ministry for nearly 30 years before I came here and did family life. But for John to be able to turn over an entire senior high ministry to me, knowing that my wife and I were going to be the main leaders of those kids and not himself that's a big deal i know because i remember what it felt like to say those kids are mine you know and and um and and i remember i remember the day john said it he goes you you are those kids youth pastor i'm the youth pastor but you are those kids youth pastor and uh, if we didn't have if we didn't have a team leadership model that would never work because it would be me and John competing for those kids' attention, which never happens because when he visits the group, the kids are excited to see their youth pastor. They love that he's there, but at the same time, they, they still know that Tanya and I are pouring into their lives. So because we love each other and because we share the ministry, then the, there's no tension. The kids don't sense attention, you know, and if, and if one of the kids, in our presence says, well, I like John better than you, or, or I like Barry better than you. We're okay with that because, but if you didn't have that kind of team leadership, if you didn't have that open handed ministry, that would cause all sorts of problems. For sure. That's good stuff. So team, team leadership to me, um, it it goes along with open-handed ministry. It goes along with collaboration. It is not top-down. So when we talk about team leadership, um, it's not, well, Eric controls everything, and whatever he says, we're, we're just waiting for whatever he tells us to do, and that's what we do. Um, we, we don't have any say. We don't have any way. It's just it's the Eric Most show and whatever he wants to do. Yeah. Um, Team leadership is, hey, here's here's some ideas, but I want some input from all of you guys. I value the input, and and uh, and so uh, the team is collectively we're deciding um, where we're going to go. Now, does there need to be point leadership? Certainly, there needs to be point leadership, but. Um, it is, it is not a top-down approach. You get way more ownership um, in that model, and, uh, and I, I love it. Um, I love having a team of people. Um, if, if, a, if I ever thought I was the smartest guy in the room, <laughs> I, know, I know myself way too well to know that that's not that's not the case. So, man, I value, and I have seen over and over again, um, the value of a team and some other people's input, no matter where the idea came from, other people input makes it better. And, uh, and man, we've been able to roll out some stuff that some things were my idea, but they were made way better by the team. Some others were other people's ideas that, uh, that again, if you didn't have team leadership, you wouldn't even, you just said, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> you know? Um, so other people are able to bring ideas to the table because it's, a, it's, a, it's team leadership. And, um, 
and ultimately the vision um we're able to take that ball way da- farther down the field faster and farther because because of team leadership. And, and another thing good about team leadership and team ownership is if something fails, then there's no finger pointing. It's like, well, we failed together. Yeah, we bombed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> when you're willing to take chances – yeah, you know that's another thing about team leadership is uh, sometimes you've got to be willing to drop the ball. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if you're gonna if you think the vision is is worth going completely after, uh, you, you got to be willing to take some risks. Yep. And there's going to be some if you're going to risk, you're gonna you're gonna have some flops. Yep. Along the way, and trust me. I've had some massive flops <laughs> along the way. <laughs> you could comment your flops if you want to. <laughs> yep. Um, the next uh, phrase that some of you may have heard, um, but vision leaks and the vision is where you're going. So how do you decide where you're going and more on the vision leaks <laughs> i this this has well it, it does have to do with this but i'm not answering the question but <laughs> i tried to communicate this idea to the worship team one night and could not remember for the life of me the word leaks and so i said vision seeps <laughs> that stuck in everybody's mind because that's just disgusting <laughs> So, comes out of every yeah. pore. Oh, it was, vision seeps. It was bad. Yeah. yeah, the vision leaks is a lot better word picture. <laughs> so what does it mean, the vision leaks? Vision oozes. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so our, our vision is, you know, we want to see people meet, follow, and love Jesus. Um and over time, that is a very outward focus. If you if you start to go through that, okay, well that 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 is very outward focus. We want to see people meet Jesus. Well, if you're going to do that, well, obviously that, you got to have an outward focused mindset. Um, and I don't care if you're you know the crossing uh, a church that you know is a hundred and 50 years old, if you're a business, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. The, the drift is when those, when those things started, uh, the vision was crystal clear. And over time, um, sometimes the vision gets lost. Uh, and in our case, in church world, Um, we can't afford to have, to, to, to lose vision of what it is God wants because Jesus gave us the vision. So we don't, you know, each church come up with our own, (laughs) our own vision. Jesus gave it to us. Um, and so, but over time, I think what can happen and, uh, and I am acutely aware of it with the crossing because, um, we are no longer a church plant. We are an established church and it would become very easy for us as you start to have, uh, a building and as you start to have more people and, and you're like, okay, well, you know, we have a place and we have enough people. Let's just call it good. We'll just meet every week and, and pay the bills and, uh, and, you know, try and minister to the people that we have, but we're not going to risk anything anymore. And, and we're, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to think uh, uh, outside the box and think edgy stuff of how could we reach people like we thought in the beginning? Cause in the beginning it's like, well, we didn't have any people, so we didn't have any people to lose. Yeah. We didn't have a building, so we didn't have a building to lose, you know? And so we were willing to risk all kinds of stuff in the beginning. Um, so over time, 
the vision can go from very easily from outward focus to inward focus to we we don't want to lose anyone and uh and again why leadership is so important we talked about this uh in in some of these uh talks uh in our podcasts how um when we start to to just take care of those that are that are inside um then uh leadership suffers um because we're just we're we're we become just consumers not owners of a vision that is outward focused if all you have is insider focused and you are and and you have just a bunch of consumers then you're going to have a church that's just complaining about everything and uh that's a that's a difficult place to be yeah when we become more focused on keeping people than reaching people is kind of the phrase that you're talking Mm -hmm. about it is the beginning of the end and it's so hard i think it's uh that's one reason why we talk about it a lot uh we would rarely rarely ever go through a Sunday without telling people what our mission statement is. Um, because you know, and, and the older a church becomes, if they're not keeping that front and center intentionally, it will unintentionally get lost. And then you'll be, and then you'll hire a new pastor and, uh, poor guy. (laughs) It's, uh, I don't know. And once the church has gone there, it's a whole nother conversation of, is it even possible to turn that church back around to be outward focused again? It, it is, it is a miracle of God. Well, I've seen it in the least. happen, you know, a few different times where, you know, a new pastor was hired and they brought the main focus back and literally what's happened every single time that I've witnessed it, it's an entirely new church. Like not saying that all the people that were there are completely gone and it's just all new people, but probably 80% of it is, is new people. And it's because we get so focused on what, what makes us comfortable and, and losing all sense of risk and wanting to reach others that, once something presses up against our comfort zone, we're gone. And unfortunately, when we lose sight of our vision, then our vision begins to press in our comfort zone. Yeah. And that's that's what makes it dangerous. Yeah, I would agree. Any pastor who is um, stepping into a church that is inward focused and has to go through the painful process of trying to recast uh, the vision of what Jesus wants the church to be, you're you're going to lose at least fifty percent, probably of your of the people. Um, It'd be interesting to take a poll of churches. It would, and just say, "What's your vision?" Mm-hmm. I, I bet you it's a super high percentage that that don't even not sure. They don't, they don't even know what the question means. Hmm. Yeah, that's how you know uh, it is completely leaked. <laughs> you're not sure what it is. It all leaked out. Um, and I would just say, in the second half of that, then you have really no idea where you're going. Right. Um, and if you have no idea where you're going, well, you're just going to bump into stuff in the dark. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, frustrating. Thank so. you for tuning in to Coffee with the Crossing, where we do an in-depth discussion on different topics. If you haven't listened to previous podcasts, I highly encourage you to do so. We have a new episode every Friday. To stay up to date with us, smash that subscribe button and the notification bell on YouTube, and like our Facebook page, The Crossing Fellowship. We'll see you later.